Well, kia ora and welcome everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning to help launch day two of Tech Week 23. New Zealand Tech Week is a platform that celebrates innovation, creativity and collaboration in the tech sector. And I'd like to thank New Zealand Tech, NZ Tech and the Tech Alliance for their work and commitment. This nationwide series of events is a fantastic opportunity to showcase the very best of our nation's technological advancements and explore the opportunities and challenges that come with them. Tech Week 23 brings us together to celebrate and build connections that will enhance New Zealand's rich tech ecosystem and New Zealand's reach to the rest of the world. We are living in a rapidly changing world and technology is at the forefront of this change and the potential is limitless. Through my work as the National Party spokesperson for all of these things connected to the tech sector, I have been privileged to have met many of you to witness some of the incredible work taking place within the tech sector and the sector being driven by innovation, consistently looking for solutions and how to better enhance our future world. It's one of the reasons I love it so much, it's all about solutions. And I'd like to first start talking, speaking to you about the future of New Zealand as a digital economy. So we live in a data-driven world. Everything we share online is processed and stored, whether we're booking a flight or posting a photo on social media. When we think about the term digital economy, what we're really referring to is the transformation of everyday activities becoming digitised. We have online systems and establishments replacing traditional structures. For example, banking apps and the infamous online bots, which I am sure you are all familiar with, particularly when it comes to online shopping. And there you have my secret. Um, technology and the way in which we do business and access services has evolved through digitisation. And New Zealanders must have a clear incentive to harness these tools and opportunities associated with digital technology as it relates to our everyday lives from customer service to the built environment. Digital technologies can help to address issues such as climate change and bolster our economy through the development of innovative weightless exports. And New Zealand has the opportunity to completely transform and harness the use of digital technologies in world-leading ethical, equitable ways that reflect the culture and the uniqueness of our country. In Aotearoa's Digital Priorities Annual Report released this year, developed in collaboration with tech leaders and 1NZ, digital leaders rated New Zealand 6.3 out of 10 for technology adoption globally, down 0.1 from 2022 and 0.3 from 2021. Leaders referenced the lack of acceleration leading to us falling behind as a country and a lack of scale and capital required to invest in or to adopt new technologies, including cybersecurity in many of our sectors. This is simply not good enough and shows that there is much more work to be done in the space. With right tools, investment, and the right government support, I believe this can be achieved. At the beginning of, our, of this year, our party leader, Christopher Luxon, asked me to establish a digitising government portfolio, not only because this worked nicely with my tech and other portfolios, but because it has become increasingly evident of the shift taking place globally in the way in which we do business and the functionality of government departments. We know that information and communication technology is at the core of a digitised economy. And I was able to see this firsthand when I travelled to Sydney this year to learn how New South Wales had successfully implemented their government's digital transformation, dramatically improving interactions between governments and citizens. And this is where citizens should say to government, what's the point of it? What's the point for me? Or even more basically, what's in it for me? And surely that is the point of government, isn't it? To serve the people. And the focus that brought about substantial change in the way the New South Wales government agencies interacted with their people was to treat them as customers. Customer service became the name 
and the focus of the government interaction with its people. Shouldn't that be the point of digitisation? To make every interaction better for the customer, to enable most transactions to be able to be undertaken no matter the time of day or where that customer happens to be. But then, and this is crucial, making sure there are sufficient well-trained and customer-focused staff to help the customer navigate the system. Because digital sovereignty is also a big consideration in the privacy world. An example of a digital sovereignty principle in play is the European General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, that establishes key requirements for data re handling related to European individuals and businesses. The GDPR's primary aim is to enhance individuals' control and rights over their personal data and to simplify the regulatory environment for international business. Examples such as this of digital due diligence will play a, a key component in policy and the decision making as we digitise government. It will be the backbone to ensure an exercise of care is taken when we consider digital footprints, tech infrastructure, data compliance, security and privacy. I'm going now to move on to an area where I have been paying a lot of attention to, and that is that of artificial intelligence and the ethical practice of AI. In my capacity as national spokesperson for technology, and I have to say the only member of parliament to hold a technology portfolio across parties, I have been doing my due diligence to educate myself and engage with leaders within the field to learn of the potential for artificial intelligence, both the good and the bad. It's a given that AI has immense capabilities. It can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of sectors such as healthcare, education, finance and transportation. We must, however, also be aware of the possible misuse of AI and it is crucial for us to understand some of the implications of AI for humanity as we strive to develop and use this technology responsibly. So last year I was appointed to the Nauwi Institute Board, and that's the Natural Artificial and Organisational Intelligence Institute led by the University of Auckland's Professor Michael Whitbrock. And he is also the strong AI lab lead in the School of Computer Science at the University of Auckland. And one of the key pillars of this institute is dedicated to the ethics and philosophy of AI, to ensure research is done in the right way for the right reasons, to have the right outcomes. And during my time on this advisory board, it has become evident to me how crucial it is that we develop and deploy uh, with AI, that all of that be guided by ethical principles which prioritise the welfare of humanity and the natural world. And this will be a pivotal piece of my work within policy making decisions. I'd like to take this opportunity to to congratulate and thank the Institute for the hard work that they're doing in this space, leading the way in this area and sharing their knowledge with not only myself, members of the board, but with the general public. So to continue to better understand AI and to depoliticise that understanding, at the beginning of this year I proposed to all non-executive members of Parliament, of New Zealand's Parliament, across all parties, an expression of interest to be part of an AI cross-party caucus. And the purpose of that caucus is to see the opportunities for us to be able to work together for a better and mutual understanding in this area. I was successful in engaging support from the majority of political parties in Parliament. And our inaugural meeting will be taking place this very evening in Parliament. And I believe this is a key first step to ensuring we as a country can be prepared and equipped for further developments of the technology. Last week, I was invited to open the New Zealand Global Responsible AI event put together by um, NSW-based company AI for Diversity, AI Forum NZ and ACM as part of AI for Diversity's global series promoting global responsible AI. I made the point that AI is here to stay. It has rapidly become a mainstream part of business and many businesses that have a adopted and adapted to it uh, is not only for the benefit of themselves, but to their customers as well. 
But we will only have the social license for AI if we can bring about ethical principles in its use. No matter how many pauses or moratoria are called for, AI will continue to evolve as new technologies and society become more advanced and it will be imperative that government has a role to play around the ethical adoption and use of AI. A role around the regulatory system which encourages the best practices of AI to enable its use to help make our lives and the lives of the planet better, more productive and sustainable. And the growth of AI is something for New Zealand actually to be excited about, not fearful about, excited, but also sensible about. And lastly, I'd like to touch on foreign direct investment, a term I know most of you will be familiar with. Well, New Zealand's a nation of startups. You know, we do have our unicorns, such as Rocket Lab and Xero. We even had the Glaxo part of GSK once. Glaxo, which in 1904 produced a dried milk powder from excess milk from dairy farms near Bunnythorpe in the Manawatu. I bet most of you haven't even been there. In 1924, the company produced its first pharmaceutical product in Bunnythorpe, vitamin D. And not all of our startups are going to be a rocket lab or become a pharmaceutical giant, but at least they should want to be. We are at this country of startups, each looking for that window of opportunity, that last little bit of capital to get everyone across the line and into the global markets. And when we look at why we're not yet a nation of scaled up, there is very evident handbrake on it, and that is actually stopping our businesses going from startup to scale up. Last year, I hosted my second tech summit from startup to scale up to try and address this gap and to come up with some solutions on how to get our startups off the ground and onto the world stage, basically global. And there are three gaps. The first is people. We must have the right talent to flourish, homegrown and those who join, choose to join us here in our country. The second is capital. Some say that New Zealand is awash with capital. Well, not the level I want it to be. We need more. And the third is that of markets. Bring the right people, bring the right capital, and they will bring the right markets. And I've been traveling up and down the country, meeting with extremely talented tech companies, big and small, from deep tech to aerospace, geothermal to food tech, and with the majority who seem to have this very issue, access to talent, access to capital, and access to markets. Well, many Kiwi startups are forced to look offshore to raise capital. To put it plainly, New Zealand just does not have the level of capital or the risk appetite that can be found overseas. We need more foreign investment, both into this country and from New Zealand to other countries. And we need that investment linked to productive sectors such as science, tech and innovation. Foreign direct investment has been proven to improve connectivity bring in capital and talent, raise productivity and wages, and lift competition, which drives innovation and raises R&D investment. We need to be looking to strive like countries such as Israel, ranked first in the world for innovative capacity, as an example of what international venture capital funding can do to catalyze new capital flows into the country. And then let's consider Ireland, ranked in the top 10 most innovative EU countries, with multinationals accounting for 10.2% of employment and 66% of all Irish exports. A country that has moved from being better known as a backwater that exported its people to a country that attracts talent, capital and markets. We need to move forward to think globally. We should be global from day one thinking like that. And if we're not thinking globally, then we, will, we might well be quaint, but we will not be relevant. We should not be threatened by overseas capital or overseas people or overseas talent. 
we should embrace productive capital and the people we, who want to be part of our success. These people bring something crucial with them. They bring contacts and they bring markets. The potential for our country is endless. We've just got to grab it. And today is not just about listening to speakers, it's about actively participating in the conversation. Throughout Tech Week 23, I encourage all of you to ask questions, share your thoughts and ideas, and connect with other members of the tech community. I hope that this week will leave you feeling inspired, informed, and excited about what is to come. Don't be afraid, we've just got to dive in there and embrace the future of tech together. Thanks very much for having me.